Welcome to another edition of George Smith Partners Finance Friday series. My name is Jonathan Lee, and I hope everyone enjoyed our last session with author Michael Lewis. I'm a principal and managing director here at GSP, and I'm deeply proud to serve alongside my fellow partners and colleagues as we seek to bring about capital market solutions for our clients. And I wanna thank those watching today as you have helped our firm shake off 2020 and generate some early success in 2021. Our first quarter numbers are in the books and I'm thrilled to report we have closed 53 transactions totaling 620 million in financing. GSP clients are entrepreneurs who focus their efforts as real estate owners and developers. My co-host of today's event, Don Griffith, has the same DNA, albeit in a different playground. Don is an entrepreneur as well, having purchased, grown, and sold three banks in his career. His last bank, Grand Point, was sold to Pacific Premier in 2018. In March, he opened the doors to his latest endeavor, Cal First, which he will discuss in a moment. Our goal today is to help our audience shape their decisions for 2021 and beyond with the insights of renowned economist, Dr. Chris Thornburg. Dr. Thornburg founded Beacon Economics in 2006 and is now the director of the UC Riverside School of Business for Economic Forecasting and Development. He became nationally known for forecasting the subprime mortgage crash that began in 2007 and was one of the few that predicted the recession that followed. Chris is an engaging presenter and I know you will enjoy his overview and insights this morning. For a little more color on that, I want to turn it over to Don Griffith. Don? Oh, thank you, Jonathan. So as Jonathan mentioned, we sold our bank Grand Point uh, back in June of 2018. Uh, we had raised money in 2008. We bought 11 banks. We sold it. So I figured that was my last bank. I was in retirement. And, I, and what I did was I became an investor in, in the development of multifamily housing in Southern California. I, I think there's a supply-demand imbalance in housing. And one of the first people I got to know was Jonathan. And working with Jonathan, I've invested in a couple of developers and um, COVID hit. And my investors that were very, very happy with the prior bank said, Don, let's get a bank. And so we bought Cal first. And so I am now CEO for the fourth time of a bank. And one of the first people I went to was Jonathan and said, Jonathan, would you be a board member of Cal first? Which he graciously accepted. Jonathan is one of the best I've ever met in the commercial real estate, Southern California ecosystem. Thanks, Don. So now I got a bank, guys. What do I do with it? I'm an entrepreneur. I love the clients. I love the customers. Um, I think there's an opportunity. I think commercial real estate, anytime there's dislocations, there's opportunity. I'm interested in banking all over the West uh, in commercial real estate. Um, and so where's the world going? Uh, what are rates going to be like a year from now? What, um, you know, we're on a sugar high with, uh, you, you know, I don't know how many trillions of dollars from the federal government. So Chris... In my, at our prior bank, every year we'd have Chris come and talk to the clients and, and uh, it was terrific. And so to, just to inform myself, if nothing else, I said, Chris, would you, would you get together with Jonathan and us and let's just talk about where the world's going. And so with that, Chris, go for it. Thank you, Don, I appreciate that. Thank you, Jonathan. Good morning, everybody. It is an absolute pleasure to be here, be back working with uh, uh, Don and of course, my first venture working with Jonathan. Um, as any good economist, I am PowerPoint dependent. So let me go ahead and get my screen up and running. All right, excellent. So again, the big question, where is this world going? It's been a truly extraordinary year, uh, unprecedented, which is, uh, which is uh, typically used incorrectly, but this time I think it's fair to say. Um, and on that basis, let me start by telling you the four big themes for what I want to talk about today. Um, the first theme obviously has to acknowledge the pandemic itself and how tragic it was. Uh, obviously, millions of families have lost loved ones. Our hearts have to go out to those families. We're still not out of the woods here in the United States. Things are better. Globally, though, there's, there's big problems right now. India is getting hammered. In many ways, this was a natural disaster. And that's important because as most natural disasters, this natural disaster had pretty tragic human consequences. But it, like natural disasters, it also has short, what I would call economic consequences. A lot of folks, of course, told us this was gonna be worse than the Great Recession. That was making comparisons to the last business cycle that were completely inappropriate, which is kind of a, something um, that I'm gonna talk about a little, in a little bit more depth in this presentation. The key takeaway here though, 
yet again was it was going to be a faster than normal recovery than regardless of what the government did. Now, what did the government do? And the answer is too much, which is an odd thing to say because typically we find fiscal monetary policy to be underwhelming. This time it has been overwhelming. Indeed, the amount of fiscal and monetary fiscal has been so overwhelming that what it has done, it has created a mountain of dry powder. It's had very little impact on the economy today, but it's creating a mountain of dry powder that will take what was already gonna be a rapid recovery and turn it into a rocket launch. But that rocket launch has costs. We all have to remember the fiscal and monetary policy is not costless. And of course, you're talking about a massive increase in the money supply, a massive increase in the, in the outstanding federal debt. And these big increases can and almost assuredly will build in certain instabilities into our next expansion. Instabilities that candidly may lead to the next downturn. We don't know. But there are consequences to the success of policy reaction. Then last but not least, thinking about that next expansion a little more clearly, particularly as it relates to commercial real estate. And you've heard all about new normals. And I'm here to tell you there's no such thing as a new normal when it comes to epidemics. Epidemics have been with humanity since the dawn of civilization. There is no new normal here. And history says people don't permanently change their behavior as a result of even these kind of tragic consequences. However, it absolutely is accelerating certain underlying trends in our economy that were already in place before the pandemic. And those acceleration of trends is important for the commercial real estate industry. And we're gonna end this talk talking a little bit about that particular situation. So with all that, let's jump right in, buckle up. I got too much information as always. Uh, look, when you first had this thing hit the US economy, the, the, the headlines we saw were off the top, over the top. Home prices are gonna fall. Uh, labor market's gonna be scarred for a decade. 30 to 40 million people are gonna be evicted. Some of my former colleagues at UCLA called this a depression-like crisis, which I felt amusing because what I wanted to do was put them in a time machine and send them back to 1932 America to see what a depression actually looks like, because this ain't it. And indeed, um, despite all this ridiculous, negative, incredibly dismal sky is falling forecasting, well, of course, it didn't turn out that way. Indeed, uh, we've seen better numbers than most people were anticipating. It absolutely has been to be. And I love this graph. This is the progression of growth rates for 2021, starting really at the beginning of 2020. And you can see how everybody was super pessimistic, only 2% growth in 2021, despite the giant fall off in activity. But of course, up, 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 the consensus forecast is finally starting to acknowledge the strength of this recovery we're in. Now, why were they wrong? Why has this been such a powerful recovery? Well, again, this was not the great recession and, and they can't emphasize this enough, completely different kind of business cycle. The Great Recession occurred because of the collapse of the subprime bubble that had so overheated the economy beforehand. This time around, actually, the economy was in really good shape when the pandemic showed up. Yes, yeah, some folks were worried about recessions. I remember in the beginning of 2019, all these 80% of economists who contributed to the Wall Street Journal said we were going to have a recession. But that kind of negative nonsense was, was never logical. And indeed, again, this thing had a relatively healthy economy. Consumer finances, we entered the Great Recession with household finances, a complete mess, a record high level of debt to income, record low savings rates. They weren't prepared for any kind of extended downturn. This time around, households financially were in really good shape. We had a record low level of financial obligations ratio and a 30-year high in the savings rate. Housing, we entered into, of course, the Great Recession with a housing market that had never seen such a massive bubble. Record high share of housing for sale for rent on the back end of massive home price appreciation, not the least, of course, has to do with explosion in subprime debt. This time around, the housing market was actually was slow coming into the pandemic because of some changes in tax law that occurred under the last uh, administration. But overall, the fundamentals were good. A very tight market in terms of the number of units for rent, and of course, very moderate overall home price appreciation. The recession driver, back then, the recession driver was a collapse in aggregate demand driven by the collapse in that, all that fake wealth that was generated by the bubble. Um, you know, when you have a big collapse in aggregate demand, it hits every part of the economy badly. It's a general malaise. This time around, it wasn't a demand shock. It was a supply shock. What do I mean by that? Well, remember, 
people didn't go to restaurants because they couldn't afford to, that was 2010. This time, they didn't go to restaurants because they weren't allowed to or they were afraid to. That's a critical difference because in that kind of world, what people do is they say, hey, I can't go to a restaurant. I'm going to spend it on, I don't know, a camper. So you have a shift in demand rather than a general malaise across the economy. And as already noted, back then, the politics of the time meant government stimulus was too little too late. And this time, politics meant it was too much too soon. So again, a completely different kind of business cycle with completely different type of reactions. Now, that became apparent really by the third quarter of last year. Indeed, you know, I like to break up this business cycle, if you will, into, into its component parts. There is a recession itself, which is peak to trough. That's how the MBR traditionally measures it. By the way, this was the deepest recession in US economic history. It was also the shortest. The peak of economic activity was February. The trough was in April. It was a two month recession. And by May, we were already in recovery. And what's amazing, and what nobody gave any kind of appreciation for, was how much mitigation helped. You gotta remember that 70% of that initial decline in economic activity had already bounced back by the end of the year, despite the fact that we were still wrestling with the virus. Indeed, in the fourth quarter of the year, we had by far and away the worst surge in new cases to date. And the only thing you can say is the recovery slowed. Now, the vaccines are getting rolled out, and now we're gonna be entering into the second part of the recovery, which is what I call the post-COVID recovery. And that is when we catch back up with what I would call long-run trends. And you know, I, when you go back to the Great Recession, this overall recovery took about seven and a half years. This time around, less than two. That's how much more rapid it is. And then of course, we get into that new normal. What does the next expansion look like? And the answer is because of all that dry powder, it's gonna be hot, hot, hot. But again, some big changes in commercial real estate that everybody has to think about. Now, going back to this idea of a winner-loser type economy, one way I could, I could talk about that winner-loser uh, structure it has to do with, say, looking at consumer spending um, by um, uh, a type. For example, durable goods sales uh, was way above trend, whereas service sales was way below trend coming into the end of last year. This goes back to what I was talking about. Services, that's restaurants, that's hotels. Well, the service sector was never going to be able to bounce back fully when COVID was still in place. So again, people shifted their money from that part of the economy to other parts of the economy. It created parts of the economy that actually have been doing incredibly well, which no one talks about. And you can see it on the right-hand side. Non-store retailers, a big shift to online sales. Sporting, hobby goods stores, hardware stores have been busy. By the end of last year, auto dealers, very, very busy. Of course, food and beverage stores, we all know. At the bottom, clothing stores, that's a proxy for malls. And of course, restaurants and drinking places. It's not at a consistent type downturn. And you can see that in terms of the pattern of consumer spending hits across California. Typically, the inland parts of the state get hit worse than the coastal parts because coastal parts are higher income, a more skilled workforce. Not this time. Remember, the supply shock closed down, particularly fly in tourism. And the coastal economies, Orange County, San Francisco, LA, have a lot of fly in tourism. They're getting hammered, they're still getting hit. But the inland parts of the state have actually bounced back very nicely. Most of their tourism is drive-in tourism, which did just fine through this. And with goods spending coming back, so too did industrial production come roaring back. Indeed, overall industrial production bounced back in six months, as much as it, as it took four years after the back end of the Great Recession. Again, no one was anticipating this, not the least of which was a global supply chain who got absolutely blindsided when you saw an enormous surge in demand for imports. Um, ports just are, are trying to catch up like crazy. Industrial production, even though it's still relatively weak to pre-pandemic, actually the ISM for manufacturing came out highest it's been since 1983. So much activity in the production part of the US economy. And as noted, those ports can barely keep up. The Port of LA and Long Beach have had to shuffle boats up to Oakland because there's too many coming in. Complete surprise. And of course, this big hit to the supply chain has also caused a big increase in some fundamental inputs. Lumber is up 56%, petroleum products 40%, iron and steel is up. You can see the increase in costs because again, the global supply chain was not anticipating this kind of rapid bounce back. And you can also see that in profits and investment in, in the United States. Take a look on the right-hand side. This is gross corporate profits, and I've broken it up into domestic, non-financial, domestic financial, and overall net global. Look how bad the hit was during the Great Recession. This time around, no hit to profits at all. Now, it isn't to say that some businesses didn't suffer. Of course they did. But for every business that suffered, another one actually saw increased profits 
because they were on the winner's side of the economy. And you can see that in business investment as well. Last year, we, it was a killer year for investment in information equipment. Now, after all, we all have to be on Zoom, software, and of course, housing came up a lot. On the other end, oil exploration way down, manufacturing structures way down, transportation equipment, that's airplanes way down. So it isn't a mixed bag. Some parts of the economy still getting hit, but other parts doing better. Here's another way of looking at it. Uh, terrible day for movie making last year in, in Los Angeles, still the movie capital of the country, way down. Cal Los Angeles has seen a very high unemployment rate because we're not shooting films right now. However, venture capital investments had a record year in 2020. Indeed, from terms of capital invested in the Bay Area, the highest ever, significantly higher in the past couple of years. Again, a winner loser type situation. Now, the parts of the economy that can't be reopened, restaurants, transportation, airplanes, entertainment, these are starting to see better trends. This is data from Opportunity Insights. It's a, it's a, a think tank out of Harvard that gets this high frequency data, which they make publicly available, which is lovely. And you can see in the last couple months that things have started to bounce back in these critically hit sectors. Um, and you can see it here, for example, on the right-hand side, hotels, better than last year, although it depends on where you are. Orange County, San Diego, still way down, but Shasta, Inland Empire, places that drive in tourism, hotels are doing pretty good. As for airplanes, well, you can see the, 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 the trends in, in TSA pass-through since the start of the year, doing much better than last year, but not quite as good as the year before. So you can see this recovery. And this is all, of course, driven by the rollout of the vaccines. We're up, we hit 4 million doses uh, the other day. So yes, a little slower than we wanted, but we are rolling this thing out rapidly. According to Goldman Sachs, uh, about 55% of the population has now acquired some resistance to the disease, either through vaccination or being exposed to it. And as a result of that, it's logical to say that we are just weeks away from herd immunity. Now, whether that's four weeks or 12 weeks depends on a lot of factors, uh, not the least of which is how many people will refuse to get it. But we are moving in that direction. And my guess is the second half of this year will be largely COVID free in the United States, outside, of course, the, the, the random outbreak that'll hear, happen here or there. And you can see it in terms of the number of new cases, which has come down pretty sharply. 230,000 cases to 54,000. Yes, it's leveled off. There's a couple hot spots, Michigan, North Texas, but of course, California itself looking great. Governor has said, we're gonna reopen the entire state as of June 15th. Again, relatively good news, nothing to say that that deadline will not be made. Now with all this good news, the one place you could constantly see lots of bad news is of course the job market. Labor markets are still way below where they were. And you can see it on the right-hand side. This is for California overall. Where are we down? Well, the sectors that are still largely closed because of the pandemic, a combination of food services, local government, arts, entertainment, recreation, other services. These parts of the economy have been closed. Guess what? They're reopening now. Go back to the numbers I was talking about. A lot of these jobs, not all of them, but a lot of these jobs are going to start coming back. Look for four, five, six months of tremendous job growth in the state and the nation overall as these sectors really start to repopulate. Again, will it come back 100%? No, there'll be a little bit of a lagging effect as the case may be, but things are definitely moving in the right direction. And you can see that again here in the state. You can look at the numbers on the right-hand side. Places that have a big fly in tourism, San Francisco, LA, Orange County, San Diego are the worst hit, still way behind in terms of jobs. However, other places, Stockton, Fresno, Sacramento, actually much closer. Again, we're gonna see these jobs come back relatively quickly. And indeed, as bad as those labor numbers look, they're not as bad as you might think. For example, take, take the idea of unemployment. Well, on the left-hand side here, you know, a lot of economists got panicked at the beginning of this because unemployment went up to almost 15%. And history says when it goes up, it takes a long time to come down. Well, that's true when this is a kind of business cycle that the last business cycle was. It wasn't. Um, this was a completely different kind of business cycle. And again, you could see that in the data. One of the primary places, the vast majority of people who quote unquote lost their jobs at the beginning of this, they didn't lose it. They were on temporary layoff. Temporary layoff was 9% of the labor force at one point in time. It's now dropped to about 1.4%, 1.3%. And to put that in context, outside of the last year, that's the highest share of the labor force ever on temporary layoff. So again, not quite losing a job when you're just waiting for your job to come back. The orange line is people who truly don't have a job in front of them. That unemployment rate, by the way, is a little bit below 5%. So what you would say is this massive supply shock to the US economy created a relatively mild recession in its wake. Again, not what people have been talking about at the beginning of this. 
Here's another place you could see it, job openings, which is already back to where it was pre-pandemic. It took almost seven years for that to happen post Great Recession. And we could see this, this is a, a, from the National Federation of Independent Businesses. Right now, the share of small business with positions they're not able to fill right now is at a record high level. So there are a lot of job opportunities already in the US economy. Right now, it's a skill mismatch. It's just about figuring out how to get people into those positions. Now, there is a little bit of hidden stress in, in the labor force that we have to think about, and that goes to the decline in participation rates, down about 1.2 percentage points for men, about one percentage point for women, a, a relatively big drop. Some of this is the kids can't go to school effect. You can see the big drop of women in that 35 to 44 year old range. That, of course, is prime motherhood years. Um, but really, a lot of this has to do with seniors. And that's an interesting question. You know. Did the seniors leave the workforce because they were worried and they're going to come back? Or do they say, hey, this is a good time to take full-time retirement? If it's the latter, remember, we came into this pandemic with an incredible labor shortage problem, and that would suggest it's going to be much worse on the back end of this. So labor shortages is still the dominant issue in U.S. labor markets, not this temporary interruption. My guess is, again, we're going to see very tight labor markets very, very quickly. And what about the idea of a K-shaped recovery? That's a term everybody likes to throw around because, again, it makes us feel that things are worse than they actually are. Well, a couple things here. All recessions have K-shaped type situations. That is to say, low-skilled workers tend to see their economic fortunes rebound slower than high-skilled workers. There's not a big surprise there. There's nothing unusual. And indeed, I would actually go the next degree and say this time around, uh, you have not seen as much of a K-shaped recovery. Take a look on the right-hand side, unemployment rates for those with a high school degree has come way down. Indeed, the gap between a high school and a bachelor degree is lower now than it was for about six years post Great Recession. And on the left, take a look at earnings, again, by level of education for those who kept their job. The general malaise across the economy back after the Great Recession meant everybody saw their wages fall, low-skilled folks worse than high-skilled folks. This time around, because some parts of the economy are doing very well, there's been no decline for wages for people who kept their job. So again, it isn't anywhere near as severe of a shock to the system as what happened during the Great Recession. Even the idea of small businesses, I get it. Tons of these small businesses are open. A lot of them will not reopen the doors because they don't know how to, they don't want to pay back 12 months of back rent. But as much as this may be worrisome, we also saw a record spike in the number of business applications here in California towards the second half of 2020. In other words, for every one of those businesses that close, that entrepreneur is getting ready to go out and open, reopen a new business. There's lots of activity out there. Those small businesses will start bouncing back in terms of quantity. It's about helping these entrepreneurs get off the ground again. Now, the question is, is are they going to have someone to sell to? And the answer is, oh, yeah, they will. Going back, of course, to the excessive fiscal and monetary policy that have been put into place. Uh, you know, at the back end of the Great Recession, we saw about $1.3, $1.4 trillion in overall fiscal stimulus. So pretty small. This time around, over $5 trillion, $5 trillion in fiscal stimulus. We've never seen before, something like that before. To almost 25% of GDP spent on our economy over the course of a year. Incredible amounts of money, hitting, by the way, an economy that, as I already mentioned, wasn't hit as hard as it was last time. Now, some of the spending they did made a lot of sense to me. For example, expanding unemployment, both in terms of payments and who could get it. Of course, that's the best system of all. Those people who didn't are outside waiting for the job to come back, keep them liquid, keep them supported, perfect. But then the numbers started getting really weird, particularly when it comes to say, just the direct transfers to people. Direct transfers to people, remember, most people, unless you lost your job, didn't see a big hit to your income. Your problem was you couldn't spend money. Giving people more money to spend when the problem is they can't spend money is largely a useless policy. Sure, everybody loves free money, but it doesn't actually help the economy. This is about politics, not economics. And politics said, lots of free money. Hey, vote for us, more free money. And we saw a phenomenal degree money pumped out there. And take a look at the right-hand side, just to see how extreme this is. The purple line is actual compensation for workers. It gets rid of government transfers, and yeah, it took a little bit of a dip, but by the way, it's already bounced back to pre-pandemic levels, despite the fact that we're still down eight and a half million jobs. Compensation for workers is back where it was pre-pandemic. Government support, by the way, has replaced three, every dollar of lost income has been replaced with $3 of government support. And remember, look at the decline in spending. 
we already would have seen a big bounce and saving grace just because the decline in spending was greater than the decline in overall incomes. But with massive amounts of government money being pumped in, well, we never seen any kind of increase in savings like this ever before. And to give you some sense of this, this was a survey that was done after that first stimulus check, $1,400, $1,200, whatever it was, went out. 80% of people use that money to save, to pay down debt, or they donated it. That's not stimulus. Stimulus is when money that's actually spent. That was only about 20% of about a little over 25%, 23% of the money. A minuscule portion was actually spent. This was not stimulus, it was politics. And the result of that, because again, it did very little for the economy in the short run. Most of it spilled right into the financial system. In 2019, all households saved what 1.23 trillion. In 2020, they saved 2.85 trillion dollars. Commercial bank deposits are $2.5 trillion above trend right now. There is so much money out there. Of course, most of this driven by these various stimulus programs. It went right through the economy, right into the financial system. It did very little for the economy in the short run. But of course, it's our economy is so packed with money, dry powder, that it's going to, again, cause this economy to take off like nobody's business. And I should point out that all this data was before... Biden actually signed the 1.9 trillion final bill. So this happened just with the first two stimulus. When this thing hits, again, I can't even imagine how much cash is floating around out there. And they've done their job. Spending for low, low income households is actually well above where it was pre-pandemic. For high income households, just a little bit above. And again, don't feel bad for high income households. Remember, they're just not spending it because they're not allowed to. But as soon as COVID goes away and they can bring the family back to Disneyland, they're gonna start spending that money. In other words, a very rapid recovery. And boy, in the meantime, can you see that money sloshing around the system? Well, how about the stock market with the second highest PE ratio ever seen? How about Bitcoin at $60,000? How about the fact that a tremendous number of millennials took their stimulus checks and put it straight into the stock market, including of course, GameStop. You could already see the instabilities in our economy being driven by all this cash floating around the system. And let's remember, as much as people like free money, it's not free money. It came an enormous cost of government debt, three trillion last year, current fiscal year, we're looking at like four trillion, seven trillion dollars in borrowing, federal government borrowing in two years. And for what? Take a look on the left-hand side. This is the financial obligation ratio. It's the share of disposable income spent on financial obligations. And you can see coming into the pandemic, it was already at a record low level just to here above 15%. The last time it was that low was back in 1980. And then what? Well, we were already a relatively wealthy generation. We're borrowing like crazy, paying down our debt and leaving it for our children and grandchildren to pay back. This isn't stimulus, this is intergenerational warfare and we are leaving our children within a massive, massive debt problem in the short run because of seven trillion of borrowing in two years, and in the long run because we haven't even started talking about how to fix Medicare and Social Security to make them sustainable for the next couple generations. So yeah, history will not look kindly on us to say the least. Now, as bad as the federal government budget problems are, here's one place we don't have a budget problem at the state level. Speaking of humorous outlooks. Of course, Gavin Newsom at the beginning of this predicted a $54 billion deficit. Even, even the economic uh, bears who told us how bad this thing was going to be laughed at that particular forecast. And by the way, California hasn't done bad at all. Remember, high income people had a great year last year, and California gets most of its personal income off high income earners. Overall, according to the data, we're actually a little bit above where we were in terms of revenue generation from the previous year. Whereas Texas, which gets a lot of money, of course, on extraction taxes, well, they're having a big budget problem right now. What about the Federal Reserve? Well, they also got into the mix. They bought in again to this idea that this was a depression type situation when it wasn't, and they went crazy in quantitative easing. Three trillion in quantitative easing within the first weeks of the pandemic, and they haven't backed off. That balance sheet is fat. And it's not just the US economy, the European Central Bank did it, the Bank of England did it, well, but we did it the most. Now the question is why? I get it, Ben Bernanke and Janet Yellen did it, but they were fighting a much worse problem. They were fighting a collapse in household net worth. They were fighting a near collapse in the, in the financial markets. 
None of those things are happening right now because of the big bounce back at home prices and the stock market and all the money being flooded in the system. Household net worth grew at a record pace from the third to fourth quarter last year. It's never been higher. And of course, as for debt markets, they're clean as can be, clean as a whistle, to be honest with you, outside of the asset back markets, which are showing a little bit of strain. What war, what battle is he fighting? And the answer is not the last one. And as a result of that, that money is going straight into the money supply. Now, interest rates have been bouncing up lately. We've seen an increase in inflation. Is this because of excess cash flowing around the system? No, it is not. This is just a recovery surge. Look, the bond markets are going, oh, hey, this isn't that bad. Ergo, interest rates go up. Businesses are saying, hey, there's a lot of demand for my stuff. I don't need to slash my prices. Inflation's creeping up. This is a recovery trend we're seeing right now. Now, it isn't to say that inflation won't hit, but to see actual inflation in this economy, you have to have a couple conditions. You have to have a lot of increase in money supply. And on the left-hand side, we've seen a huge increase. That purple line on top is what we call unit money supply. It's basically the amount of dollars in the system divided by the amount of actual GDP, the amount of transactions going on. This, and at some level, you know, economists are pretty blasé about inflation because of the fact that really since about 1996, maybe even 2000, we've been increasing money supply relative to GDP with no inflation. But we also have to remember that unit money supply was actually relatively low in the late 90s. And let's also keep something in mind. While it is true we increased from 2000 to 2019, we've never quite seen the increase that we've seen in the last year. So this is a true experiment it's completely outside the bounds of any kind of money supply experiments we've seen anytime in the near future. Indeed, one could argue that if you were ever going to see inflation, it's right now. But it isn't just money. There's a couple other things you have to worry about. First, you have to have a tight economy as a measure of proxy by unemployment, capacity utilization. That hasn't happened. Yes, some parts of the economy are hot, but other parts are still cold. And then there's one last ingredient, which is a big surge in aggregate demand. And here it comes. That's the White House $3 trillion package. I guess it's $2 trillion now for infrastructure. You have, yes, the perfect recipe for inflation. Not now, but in 2023. Now, things could back off. This bill may not be that big. The Federal Reserve may back off as well. I can't tell you we're going to have inflation, but I can tell you the risk of inflation right now is the highest it's been in the 20 plus years that I've been in the forecasting game. So yes, be worried. And if inflation does kick in, interest rates are going to go up. This then another way of saying that is take a look now at these interest rates and appreciate they're going to be higher in the future, not lower, and plan accordingly. Simple as that. Um, now, of course, with all this money floating around, we also saw it in the housing market. A lot of negative views there. But again, the housing market has come roaring back second half of last year. Sales are up. Price appreciation. 2019, home price appreciation, 3.7%. In 2020, 10.4%. In fact, this has been the biggest surge in prices since, yes, the middle of, the, of that massive pre-Great Recession bubble. And you could see just how hot it was and the difference in the markets. Remember, back then, we had too many units when the housing market collapsed. This time, we had too few units. And of course, what's interesting is look how different this is. In the Great Recession, a huge collapse in home building. This time, a big surge in home building. If this doesn't tell you it's a different kind of business cycle, I don't know what would. Now, what caused the market to take off? Well, there's a lot of things there, and I don't want to spend too much time in this. But part of it was simply the fading away of the hits the market took from higher interest rates and the change in tax policy that occurred under the Trump tax plan. This year, in other words, 2020 was already going to be a good year for real estate just because we got back to better fundamentals. It was ready for the market to pick up again. But then you throw into that mix, people stuck at home looking around going, I want a bigger house, I have tons of savings, and wow, look how low these interest rates are. And you ended up with a situation by which the market got very hot very quickly. And I can tell you that, you know, housing markets have a very, have very much a feedback loop, which means when they're cold, they tend to get colder. And when they're hot, they tend to get hotter. And this was a circumstance that pushed us from cold to hot, and that hot market is going to stay in place for a while. Now, is it a bubble? No, absolutely not. Housing is, believe it or not, still very affordable. And that means it's not a problem at this point in time. Whether you're looking at nationally, look at mortgage payments as a, as a percent of DPI, never been lower. People are not mortgage cost transferred. Even here in expensive California, we hear all about the affordability crisis. Yet take a look at mo median monthly owner costs as a percent of household income. This is only for households with mortgages. And in, despite the big increase in prices over the last decade, 
actual owner costs have been falling because incomes and the cost of owning a home driven by interest rates has actually been falling. So no, we're not housing cost constrained. It is not a bubble in that sense. And you could see that, of course, in the fact that mortgage markets, yet again, as already noted, are super clean right now. And forbearances, yes, they're out there. People took this decision and they're realizing they don't need to. Again, this housing market is going to stay strong for a while. As far as we're talking about national housing, California housing, as always, our housing market is whatever the nation's doing times four. And, uh, you know, we had a very tight housing market. We entered into this and it became even tighter, frenetic pace. You've heard the stories of, you know, a house going for sale and, and you know, up in Contra Costa County or down in Torrance and 50 people putting offers on it in the first week. That's the real deal. And as a result of that, inventories are insanely tight, one month supply. And did we saw a decline in sales at the beginning of this year, not because there's a decline in band, because there's simply not enough units out there. And prices here yet again are growing like crazy. LA, San Francisco, you see the numbers on the right hand side. These are medium prices, so they're pushed around a little bit, but across the board, big increase in prices. And that's different than, of course, than the apartment markets. Apartment markets are looking relatively cool right now. Now, it isn't what you think it is. I know that 30 to 40 million number, you've heard all that. You know, right now, there is a problem in multifamily housing, but not as bad as you might think. Indeed, Overall, the number of people who are paid their mortgage in January of this year was about 93.2, not mortgage, because the rent uh, was about 93.2% relative to the previous year, which was about 95.8%. So only about two and two and a half percent, uh, percent percentage points of renters are having trouble paying their rent. Then why do we keep hearing about this eviction problem for 30 to 40 million people? Well, this goes back to politics and miserableism. Um, look, this is a bad interpretation of data that came out of the Pulse survey. There's zero reason in the world to think this is true. Yet, of course, it's bad news and politicians love it, so they grabbed onto it. Now, it is true that there are problems in the market. Look at, say, for example, cost of rent here in Southern California. They're down in LA. They're down in Orange County. They're only up in the Inland Empire. And vacancy rates have been drifting up. But this is an absorption problem. It is not a rental income problem. That is to say, people aren't moving very much, or if you are moving, you're moving out into the burbs and you're getting a house. Um, if you have a new apartment building open, you're having a devil of a time keeping people in there. But, but remember, ultimately, last year wasn't that bad. Overall number of housing units actually picked up a bit. And the biggest problem in California is a problem we've had for 25 years. We don't have enough housing. And this is something that's been a centerpiece of my conversation. Don knows all about this, and I can go on and on about the numbers whether you're talking about overcrowded housing, housing cap units per capita, rental, vac I'm sorry, vacant housing, California has the tightest housing market in the nation because we don't build enough. And that hasn't gone anywhere. Indeed, in 2020, we saw yet again, an enormous out a movement out of the state, people fleeing to places like Arizona, Nevada, Idaho, Texas. It's not the economy, it's not taxes, it's a sheer lack of housing. And the only thing you can say about the last year is at least housing permits didn't collapse. But to get to the governor's lofty goals that were part of his campaign promises, you're still gonna need two to three times the amount of permits we're actually seeing in the state right now. What that means is those problems in, in apartment markets in California are at best temporary. Huge housing shortage, it isn't going anywhere, this economy's about to rocket back and those rental markets will keep following them. If you're in the multifamily space, once you get through this, things are gonna be super clean. Now on the commercial side, a little bit different. Less of a slowdown in overall commercial construction, because as you know, these are years in the making and thus a one year turnaround doesn't change this, but permits are down quite a bit. But better signs in the commercial markets, for example, sales by the end of last year started picking back up. No major problems in the debt markets, as I already showed you. Overall cap rates have been on trend right through this. In other words, yeah, we get it. There's a short run hit. From a long run perspective, everybody's com comfortable. This isn't a big meltdown and the market is proceeding accordingly. Uh, even in terms of, of bank lending standards, they tighten up at the beginning as they typically do. Everybody's worried, you gotta be worried about stuff, but the banking system has actually loosened up according to the Senior Loan Officer Survey and it is getting easier to get a loan out there right now. Now, what kind of loans, where should you be looking? Well, here's the big, here's what, this is some graphs I just love to death. It tells us a little bit better about what happened last year. Vacancy rates, basically went up in the middle of this thing for every type of, of class of real estate. Now retail, we'll save that for just a second. Obviously we know that that's happening, but of course it also went up for offices and industrial. 
continuations of trends are already in place pre-pandemic. While we got into the pandemic itself, vacancy rates were both starting to go up and it was a net absorption problem right from the get-go. That is to say, we were building lots of industrial, but net absorption wasn't enough to absorb it all. Well, until the fourth quarter of last year, when there was a huge surge of net absorption industrial and lo and behold, vacancy rates started to go down. Complete opposite for office, which of course is seeing negative net absorption. People are leaving office space. And it gets back to the basic idea about how this pandemic has changed our world. And you can see the data here in terms of vacancies and rent. Most places are seeing increases in office vacancy rate with the exception of Phoenix, which is an incredibly strong economy right now. Uh, and whereas of course, vacancy, uh, warehouse looks a little bit stronger. Uh, how, why, where does this go? Well, here's a couple of things to keep in mind. When you're thinking, as I already noted, the pandemic is accelerating underlying trends. For example, the movement to online sales. Huge movement of e-commerce uh, into, of course, the basic brick and mortar retail store. It bounced back a little bit towards the end of last year. People still starting on back stores. But you know, when people start buying stuff online, they don't stop. And yet again, we're faced with this basic issue in the state of California. We have too much retail space. By the way, it's true across the United States. It's true in Canada. It's true in Australia. We have too much retail space. Now, I was gratified to see just the other day, I think it was yesterday, I heard that there is a bill in Sacramento that would make it very easy to take retail space and convert it into mixed use. I'm so for this bill. It's a classic idea. Please, if you know about it, call your legislator and push on it. It's a great way of, of killing two birds with one stone, getting more housing and taking making that retail space more valuable. Keep in mind, this is not for destination retail. This is suburban retail. This is what gets hit by this stuff. And what about offices? We know they got hit. And this goes back, of course, to the work from home phenomenon. Now, the work from home phenomenon, you know, there is this, you know, obviously the, you know, everybody always has this over the top story. Hey, everybody's gonna work from home. No offices are ever gonna be used again. But no, that wasn't gonna happen. Look, what we learned over the last year is yes, people can work from home if management puts the right procedures in place. But we also learned a couple other things. You still need an office for training. You still need it for collaboration. You still need it because your workers don't wanna be home. On the right hand side here is a survey that was done last year by Stanford University, and I love this. 25% of people said, yeah, I'd be happy working from all the time. 33% said no more than one day a week and probably not at all. In other words, 33% of working households have kids. Um, they don't want to be stuck at home. They want an office to go to. So offices are not going away. But take a look on the left-hand side. This was done, of course, uh, uh, a survey done by the Atlanta Fed. And again, I love this kind of survey. Uh, they asked a bunch of office using companies work from home. They said prior to the pandemic, about 10% of all days were work from home. In the pandemic, 43% of days work from home. After the pandemic, they're anticipating 30%. So if you go from 10% to 30%, three times as much, you can easily say that companies will tend to shrink their footprint per employee, something on the order of about 15 to 20%. That's going to create a lot of empty space. Now, what does that mean for office as a category? Well, here's what it doesn't mean. Everybody keeps talking about the death of downtowns as a result of COVID. Forget about it. It is absolutely false. Yes, in the short run, there's no point in being downtown. But remember, people live downtown, not because they want to be close to work, but because they want to be close to restaurants, museums, bars, music venues, public transport. And you know what? As soon as COVID goes away, they're going to go back downtown for all those amenities. And as for businesses themselves, what are the big things to keep in mind about being downtown? There's efficiencies to it. How do we know that? Because downtowns exist. Listen, we know downtowns are expensive, but nevertheless, you always have these big agglomerations of companies there. Why? Well, economists call this external economies of scale. You're close to your vendors. You're close to your clients. Uh, it's, it's panache. It, you've got a liquid labor market. You want to be downtown. The offsetting effect is how much it costs to operate downtown in terms of getting your people in and out of the building and, of course, the cost per foot of office space. Downtown is expensive. Now, imagine for a second that every company in downtown shrinks their footprint by 15% per employee. What does that mean? A lot of extra space downtown, downtown becomes cheaper. By the way, it's now less expensive for workers to get downtown if they can work from home a couple days per week. And that result of that is downtowns are going to flourish in the back end of this. And it's now more than ever that you get again, need to think about those suburban office buildings. Those are the ones that are gonna to continue to suffer. What do we do with those? As for downtowns themselves, they're gonna come roaring back not, no surprise at all on that particular front. So not exactly what people have been predicting. It's going to be the 
new time for downtowns. So wrapping it up, and hopefully I didn't take too long here, but there's no doubt that what happened over the last year, truly unprecedented, tragic for the hundreds of thousands of Americans, the millions of, of people worldwide who've lost their lives. Or again, our hearts have to go out to those families. However, the V was the only logical outcome. The V is exactly what has occurred. You had the beginning of the V last year. It stalled at the end of last year because of the enormous new surge. And the rest of the V is going to take off towards the end of the year. Yes, some parts of the economy are still in distress, but there's lots of built pent up demand for those sectors. A lot of pent up demand for travel, a lot of pent up demand for restaurants. They're going to come back. And one other thing why I'm talking about how things aren't that bad. We heard a lot of comparisons of this to the Spanish flu. Spanish flu killed 50 to 75 million people worldwide. And if you compare that to the population base, which is one fourth what it is today, you realize the Spanish flu was 100 times more deadly, 100 times more deadly than COVID-19. We got lucky. I hope to God we're better prepared next time around. Forecast for this year, huge growth for, the, uh, for this year. I, my anticipation is by the end of 2021, unemployment at the national level will be both back below 5%. Yes, global tourism is going to lag, but beyond that, the economy is going to be go, go, go. Indeed, you may find excessive growth over the next couple of years, the new roaring 20s. Are there variants? Sure, there's always wild cards, new variants of the virus. Got to worry about bubbles, interest rates going up, the public debt problem, I get it. But ultimately, the biggest problem of all is yet again, the disconnect of politics and the news from basic reality. You know, this was a problem before the pandemic where everybody was running around telling us how terrible things were. And it became a bigger problem in the pandemic when an absolute ridiculous over the top panic about the economy has led to, of course, excessive policy reactions. And yet again, we're going to pay the price for that in the years to come. But not for a few years. Again, for the next few years, rock and roll, you're going to be doing just great. Whew. Thank you, Chris. Up there. And uh, oh, I think I did. Good on timing, as a matter yeah, of fact. Yeah, I did great. Thank you so much. Just uh, for our audience right now, there's a question and answer bar, and Don and I are going to field a few questions now for Chris. So please feel free to type in. Um, got a couple in the queue right now, but uh, if you don't mind, uh, Chris, here's a question. Um, I think you touched on this, but Chairman Powell has indicated the next fund increase will occur by 2023 at the earliest. Do you, do you agree with that? <laughs> no. <laughs> I think he. He worries me. He worries me to death. You talk about the theory of group thing, right? I, you know, the other day someone said, what about inflation? And his, his basic response was, eh, inflation slimation. It's like, really? I, I, he's just, he's got his foot in the gas pedal like nobody's business. Yeah. How can that not be inflation risking? And he doesn't seem to get it. Um, the part of this may very well be the fact that we do for the first time in a very long time, we don't have an economist running the federal reserve mm. and, and, you know, I'm sure he was a great lawyer, but I don't necessarily think you want him doing brain surgery or any either. Um, yeah, I don't get it. And, and it presumably has handled before us before, before then. Got it. Got it. Uh, if you like spreads, should get you know, I see a nice increase in spreads over the next couple of years. Hey, uh, Don, you're uh, you're on mute right now, so you get, yeah, go ahead. Hey, Chris, do we ultimately just inflate the debt away, the government, the, the, the national debt? I mean, you're not going to tax people to pay down the debt. You're not going to. Where are we headed beyond the next two to three years? You you you, you could try to inflate your way out of the debt, but you got to keep something in mind. One of the reasons that our federal government has been able to borrow so much is because of the fall in interest rates that they're paying. As much as much money as they brought on board, actual interest payments as a percent of GDP are still below where they were in the 80s, despite the fact that we have a lot more debt. Now, here's the issue with inflation. Inflation causes interest rates to go up. A phenomenal share of US government debt is in one, two, and five-year securities. In other words, they're going to have to turn that over and they're going to pay a lot more for that debt if inflation does start to creep in. So you could try to inflate yourself out of it, but given where we are right now as a nation, that's going to precipitate a short run problem with enormous increase in interest payments for the federal government. Okay. So if interest rates go up, what are the secondary consequences? Stock market, you know, I mean, I can see, I, are there, there are borrowers out there that can they afford, you know, I hear zombie companies, for example, that, that right. 
that are kept afloat by low interest rates. The consumer seems to be pretty, pretty healthy, pretty healthy. Yeah, I, I don't think the consumer talk can about, handle it. Talk about rising yeah. rates. What, what, what are the consequences? Well, uh, honestly, look, there's a couple. There's, I would argue, there are are two major problems with with rising rates. I mean, first of all, it obviously precipitates a, what I would call a revaluation, right? It's it's uh, interest rates are a critical part of the of the of the cap rate valuation. Interest rates go up, you need more cap rates, and that means a lower price you're willing to pay. So you obviously have the short run wealth effect hit, which is a problem. The second problem, of course, is uncertainty. You know, people don't appreciate it. When rates are up, they're also a lot more uncertain. And just the swings in interest rates can create uh, risk problems, which again, get reflected in terms of, of prices. It's as simple as that. So you do end up with a big price hit from those particular situations. Uh, and then, you know, as, 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 as you noted already, then you already have the government problem, which also becomes a big issue because suddenly they're having to borrow money to pay on their borrowed money. And that creates even a worse problem on that front. And they start yet again, absorbing excessive amounts of capital in the debt markets. And just right now, you know, in a typical year over the last decade, um, you've seen about two and a half trillion dollars net increase in U.S. debt levels. And that's private and public together. And in two years, you have the federal government absorbing seven trillion dollars of debt. Now, again, that's that's a lot of demand on those on those markets. Which, yeah, I get it. We have a global supply capital supply glut right now, but this is absorbing it pretty quick. And and the you know the back end of this is not pretty. Um, now, will it cause a recession? And and the answer there is traditionally inflation has not caused recessions. It's put stress on the economy put a lot of stress on the economy. It's certainly turned elections because people don't like inflation. People are angry about inflation, but it doesn't tend to create recessions. This tends to slow the economy down. What creates recession is fighting inflation. Remember the early eighties, the whole Volcker stepping on the brake. And of course he spent the U said the U S economy right into a tailspin and he got control of inflation. He did the right thing. We were better off for in the long run, but obviously the short run we had, what was at that point in time, those back-to-back -back recessions we saw in the early 80s were the worst recession since the Great Re since the Great Depression, and were only exceeded by, of course, the Great Recession. So we're getting a couple of questions, and I'm going to try to put them together here because it's the same topic, and you alluded to it in the in the presentation, Chris. Um, we're seeing for a lot of our construction projects, and you mentioned it, the the high cost of lumber, as an example, right? And the high cost of labor. And the I mean, again, you want to talk right. about where there's a lot of job openings, construction, right? right. So the, the question is, you know, you, you alluded to it, is, is this a supply thing? Also insurance is up, but I don't ask you to speak to insurance, but do you see lumber turning around? What, what's, gonna, what's gonna change the paradigm for, for hard costs? Uh, well, again, it's, it's about global supply catching up, right? We right. always have these problem with commodities, right? Because commodities are always trying to guess what's gonna happen next. And, right. and if they miss it, then you either have over or under supply. Oversupply means really cheap prices, a lot of pain for the commodity producing industries. Undersupply means high prices and, and again, a really good profits for the commodity producing industry. Right. Right. Um, this time around, again, a lot of people bought into this idea that this was gonna be a 10 year business cycle and no one was prepared for this enormous bounce back in overall, in overall goods trade. And yeah, it's putting a lot of stress in the commodity markets. They will catch up eventually. But yeah, I think there's going to be a couple of years of those high prices. Got it. Don? You know, Chris, if, if, if labor is constrained now, we don't have, you're basically saying the labor force, we're going to have, we're going to have a hard time getting enough workers. Absolutely. Yeah. So if, Absolutely. You have lot, if, if you have a lot of demand and you can't produce as much because you don't have the workers, do we, the, what happens? Do we just import more with all of that, that, that spending because you can't produce? What, 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 talk, talk about international. Yeah, well, the question is, is what happens when we start becoming labor constrained and, and really two things start to happen. One is the economy starts to engage in more labor saving productivity kind of enhancements. Right. In other that's, words, that, that's you know, good. Yeah, that, that's good. I mean, that's one of the things you have to do. Um, the second thing that happens is, yeah, immigration tends to pick up because, you know, you have a situation by which um, people immigrate on the basis of, of how easy it is to immigrate and what the kind of opportunities you get for immigration. So if you have a very tight market here, labor market here, you just have more people trying to get into the country legally or illegally. Yeah, they will come here. Um, and I would like us to 
have a national conversation about immigration. Now more than ever, it's desperately necessary to figure out how to bring people in. Now, some things have already happened. One of the things that the Biden administration quietly did was they expanded access to H-1B and H-1A visas. So they're already allowing more people in. Um, my guess is there's going to be some movement on these dreamers. And as you know, I mean, look what's already happening at the border. We have a huge border crisis because, uh, you know, we swapped administrations and, and people just started coming here rapidly. So you are, we'll see what I would call that moving in, into the U.S. And I, I would just tell policymakers, you know, look, if you don't get your heads in order here and sit down and create a workable compromise and you just sit there on your partisan laurels and, and point fingers and yell at each other, this is, we're gonna have a lot of immigration and it's gonna be, again, completely uncontrolled, who, what, how, where. No, that's the wrong way of dealing with this. We need to have a system because the reality is the U.S. needs people. Um, slightly separate topic. Uh, we've heard it's, there's a, a friend of the firm who said that uh, the United States economy is, is the uh, cleanest shirt in the dirty laundry basket. Right. And they say that in regards to us being the, the second, reserve. Second, second cleanest. All right. Second, second, okay. China is the cleanest. Okay. Well, they say that in regards to us being the world's reserve currency. So if, is there any threat in your mind of the dollar losing that status? And if so, you know, what, what does that do to our rates? I know, no, because nobody trusts China. So the yuan is not going to become the global reserve currency. And the EU, yet again, um, the euro, I think, is, is probably the, the, biggest competitor for the dollar right but again it's it's not like the e, the euro is that much better to use than the dollar you know habits die hard <laughs> so people just keep working in dollars and yeah we're probably better off for that uh, candidly if it stopped being the reserve currency it won't be the end of the world for us okay interesting what about uh the digital currencies that are coming up now so england's announced one trying to you know it's it's a it's a topic to draw right now. Well, first of all, uh, can I explain something? We 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 before Bitcoin was invented, we already had a digital currency. It's called the U.S. dollar. Okay. Ninety-eight point five percent of all money in circulation in the United States is electronic. It doesn't actually exist. Okay, so we had a virtual currency, uh, and the idea that tomorrow we need another one is is obviously silly. Um, and I can tell you from an economic standpoint that the fundamental value of Bitcoin is zero. Mm -hmm. zero it doesn't have any value it's a preposterous thing um but it has it's worth sixty thousand dollars why well it's a narrative right it's a story i, I just finished back i like to tell people you want to pick up a really good book i should be getting i should be getting commissions off of uh, from robert schiller on this but his latest book is called narrative economics and he talks about how human beings are not we're not mathematical calculators we are storytellers Right. That's what I am. I'm an economist. Yeah, I use data, but I'm telling you a story. And, and in a lot of sense, stories are how human beings think. What I have to do as an economist, I got to take the data and tell people what the story means. And I try to do that as accurate as I can. So they have the best story. But unfortunately, a lot of people tell stories out there and they aren't always accurate. And stories can become viral and, and, and can have a real influence on things. And that's true whether we're talking about the story about how 30 to 40 million people are gonna be evicted, causing every state government to run around passing eviction moratoriums, even though it's completely a phantom threat that doesn't exist. Or the story that, hey, Bitcoin is actually valuable. And there's, you know, you got this, this secret guy who created it and, you know, you could dodge around the government and you got this whole Robin Hood aspect to it. And, and it, that story has created value, but it can only do that for so long. Right. At some point in time, the story breaks. There was a story in 2005 about how everybody could be a real estate millionaire. Mm -hmm. There was a story in 1989 about how you could buy these little stuffed animals called Beanie Babies and become a Beanie Baby millionaire. <laughs> right. So these things happen. And, and yes, I have about as much faith in Bitcoin as I do in Beanie Babies. That's that's an amazing analogy. And you just blew the mind of everyone under 35 in my office. So well, for anybody who remembers going, the Beanie they're Baby gonna bubble. let me have it. You had to remember the Beanie Baby bubble. bubble. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> hey, hey Chris, Beanie Baby and Bitcoin. Chris, so I'm old enough to kind of look back. You mentioned 1980. Do you remember? Yeah, I remember. Um, we've been at a 40 year period of falling rates, lower taxes, more globalization, a baby boom, people coming in. Yeah. 
looking really long term, I don't have enough time left to, to enjoy another 40, but uh, there are people out there that do. Are we sort of, uh, who the hell knows, but, but I just sense a lot of those things are reversing or changing or, well, rates aren't going lower for the next 40 years. Yeah. yeah. I, I, how much lower can they go, right? I mean, that, that's a global there's supply glut. Yeah. There's just a whole sort of, I mean, we're at a, we're at a sort of a, a shift in the narrative of the world. It, it just seems to me. John, Chris, yeah. oh, I'm, sorry to, I'm sorry to interrupt this, but we, we're, at, we're at the clock. So oh. if you want oh. the answer, log on next time for us. Uh, next Finance Friday is coming up on Friday, uh, May 14th at 10 a.m. with Brian Schaefer and David Pascal. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today. If you have any additional questions on financing, please reach out with your contact here at GSP. We really appreciate that. And thank you again, Chris, Don, for joining us today and giving us this insight for this afternoon. And really appreciate it. And yes, we will be posting the video online later on our GSP channel. And Chris, if you're kind enough to share the deck, we'll be happy to circulate that as well. We'll get a PDF out to you. Thank you, guys. Really appreciate it. Best of luck. All thank right. you, Chris. Have a great weekend, everyone. Okay. Bye-bye.